I was born in Stroud, Massachusetts, and I was brought, and, I, and my mother and my sister and I left my father and came home to live with my aunts in Brighton, three maiden aunts who took care of my sister and me and my mother. Until Ma died, we lived there, and then they brought us up. And the three aunts were wonderful people. Without them, I don't know what would have happened to my sister and to me. My Aunt Anne was a school teacher for 50 years, and my Aunt Elle was blind, and she used to sing the requiems at St. Columns Hill's Church. And my Aunt Kate was a seamstress. She was a Dunphy. The other two, of course, were Nettles. And uh, I lived in Brighton, Mass, and I went to the public schools around the area. And I had my first communion and all the other sacraments at St. Columbia's Church in Brighton. And uh, after I went from uh, the public schools in Boston, I went to Boston College High School. And then from Boston College, I, Boston College High, I went to BC, and at BC I got my bachelor's degree. And then I got what they call the O'Malley Teaching Fellowship. And I taught at Boston, I attended Boston College to get a Master of Arts and wrote my master's degree up there on Sir Walter Scott, the historical novelist. Following that, following many years of frustration, I finally passed the exam in Boston, became a teacher there. And after a short while, I was draft, I got drafted like so many others in 1942. Everybody else is going, so I suppose I have to go. That was it. And, and I went and did what I was told, kept my big mouth shut. I learned that fast enough. And went into the infantry by way of Fort Devons, and the interview at Fort Devons, the uh, man who interviewed me asked me if I had any preferences. I said, well, I had a bum leg growing up. I hope I never see the infantry. Oh, he says, you never will. So 24 hours later, I was on a train going to the infantry at Camp Wheeler, Georgia. And I went through basic training down there. It wasn't too sharp. Uh, and one day we were using the obstacle course with a rifle, and I went over the, an obstacle, and I broke my arm. The tickle dead bases, Camp Wheeler, Georgia. You were up at the crack of dawn, of course, and then you had breakfast. And then whatever the day was where they had a close sort of drill, or learning about the weapons or being on the range, firing the weapons. They did various things. You know, all that had to do with you becoming a soldier, especially the physical aspect of it. While I was taking basic training, one day I was on KP as a buck private and uh, they sent for me for what I didn't know. So I went down to see the company commander. He says, me, he says, with your background, he says, we're gonna have you teach the illiterates at night. So he says, you won't have to do KP or any of that from now. From now on, oh, okay, I'll do what I'm told. So five nights a week, I would teach the illiterates, try to give them the basics of reading and writing. And then uh, they decided that uh, may maybe I might be off of some material. So I went before the board. The board consisted of a full colonel, a major, a captain and a lieutenant. The lieutenant was my patrol commander who wasn't too bright. But anyway, I went before the board and they asked me several questions, which were rather simple to answer. And the uh, platoon leader to try to make himself a big shot, he says to me, no, 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 he says, I want you to wait. He says, I'm going to give you some numbers. And I want you to add them up and give me the total. So he gave me the numbers, uh, six or seven numbers. And when I was a kid, I worked in the first national stores. And I, in those days, there were no computers. We did all our adding on the pencil on the side of the bag. So by the time he gave me the last number, I gave him the answer. No, 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 wait, I haven't done it yet. The colonel looked at me and looked at him. Thankfully, the colonel's name was O'Connor. So we thought, OK, Lieutenant, that's enough. So anyway, I got through. I didn't know whether I passed or not. But that night, he came to me and he said, me, he says, you did an awful job. You made me look like a fool. I said, no, I didn't. I said, you made yourself look like a fool with the stupid questions you were asking me. Oh, well, to make a long story short, then I uh, as I said, I broke my arm when I went over the obstacle course and I went to the uh, hospital down in Camp Wheeler. 
And while I was there, they had me teaching the illiterates there. And uh, whatever happened, I passed the physical to go to uh, OCS. So I left the hospital, went to non-com school. So at non-com school, there was a young lad there, but I forget his name, but he was a Harvard graduate. Uh, he was a captain, and he was running the school there, so he asked me if I wouldn't be good enough to uh, put on a lesson for him. So, so I put on the lesson, some brass came down from Birmingham to check him. The le lesson well, went well, so to make a long story short, I became a corporal. We had had a corporal in basic training. Oh, he was a son of a gun, if ever there was one. So when he went back to the barracks, I had to wait till I would go to Benning. And this bum, they had a retreat there the night, and I didn't go out. I stayed in shower. Wonderful, take a shower by myself, nobody else there. So he came in and gave me hell. He said, yeah, I'm going to train you one of the captain. Didn't stand retreat. Said, ah, don't bother me, you jerk. Don't you call me a jerk. I'm a corporal. I said, so what? So he goes down to the captain. <laughs> and the captain, he reported to the captain. The captain said, that's always just what I tell you. He said, I don't think you can do it because he's a corporal the same as you are. Why didn't you tell me you were a corporal? I said, you dingbat, I wouldn't bother telling you. I said, but you better pray I never come back here as an officer. Because I said, you're a mean son of a gun, you, gun you always were. Woo! After I got through non-com school, I went to Benning, <laughs> Benning School for Boys. And I got through Benning well. We had a company commander there who was a great, great fellow and very sympathetic. And when you first went to Benning, you had to write like an autobiography. And then the company commander and the officers in charge would go over that. And we did the daily drills, the hikes and all that, study the manual, did what we were told. And we had uh, field trips. And everything worked out rather well. But I was exhausted. God, you didn't get time to blow your nose in the mind of everything else. Jeez. The IRTC, the Infantry Replacement Training Center. So it was a good training. But you earned your degree when you got up. The bad thing was you never knew till the last moment. For example, the day we, we were commissioned, <coughs> when we left that morning, we came back from breakfast and there were eight beds there and the mattresses were rolled up. Those eight were pulled out. They didn't make it. But you never knew to the last minute. Which is kind of difficult for those that didn't make it. An awful lot of them came from New England, and a lot, an awful lot of us had degrees. I was already successful in business. So that this sounds conceited, I don't mean it that way. But some of the non coms we ran up against weren't that bright and didn't have that much of a background. So they would like to push us around, but we didn't let them push us around. And fortunately, we had a company commander, Captain Hallman, who was a great fellow. He was a graduate of Clinton. In one particular night, when I was walking guard as a private, he came out about four o'clock in the morning, and I said, oh, what's this? So who was it but the captain? Me, he says, I just thought I'd let you know this is your Boston College man. I said, yes, sir, I am. Well, he said they had a big fire in Boston, the coconut grove. And he told me about that, and I thought, oh God, had I been home, I might have been there. Well, that was the beginning of, of friendship with him. And that, of course, was the undoing of that corporal who was tough with everybody. Because he didn't know where I went, and I, none of his business, I never told him. I went to Benning, got to Benning, Benning, they caught Benning School for Boys at 90 days. God is a wonder we got, is a wonder we survived. However, God was good, I had a wonderful platoon leader there. John Hassel, his name was, and he took pity on me, and you know, you never know whether you're going to make it, weren't going to make it, and they waited till the last day before the final assembly. So about a week before the end of it, it was my turn to be the, the company commander, and it, you have to have a big mouth, get up on the PT stand and give him commands. So up to that time, I've been kind of milk toast, shut my mouth. So I got up on the stand and gave the command, you know, look. And the colonel he says, Mead, where did you get that voice? He says, God gave it to me. God, he says, we, we were going to 
put you out because we figured they had no vote. You'll be fine. Well, to make the long story short, I became the second lieutenant. And I called my, with my fiance, my wife Mary, I called her, go ahead with the wedding plans. So we had a week's leave and I came home to Boston and Mary and I got married at St. Columns. And that was the beginning of a happy marriage. We got 10 days after we were commissioned. And that's when I got married. Got married then. My wife, well, we went on a so-called honeymoon. We, uh, my first station was uh, Camp Joseph Robinson in Little Rock, Arkansas, according to God. So we went by train naturally and got out of Little Rock to get off the train. They got, me, send your wife home. We're all going to Africa. <laughs> well, Mary stayed for three days and then she came home. And uh, I went to Joseph. Joseph T. Robinson, but they kept me there because of my, my educational background. A lot of the guys left right overseas, but they, I stayed in Joseph Robinson for two or three, oh, four or five months. Then we moved down to Camp Fannin, Texas, in an IRTC down there. And that's where we had further training, training others and training ourselves. And the year after, uh, uh, after getting there, once you spend a year in your slater to go overseas. A lot of the guys that got shipped overseas, but for some reason, because of my big mouth, they kept me. But then after the year was up, I was assigned to the uh, 97th Infantry Division. Then they were in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. God, what a place that was, that Missouri. Woo! However, so I went to Fort Leonard, Missouri, and the first day I arrived there, they said, me, take this heavy weapons company and we're going to attack this hill. Jeez, Mary and George, what do I know about that? Anyway, I took the Heaven Weapons, weapons Company, and the guys, of course, had the, the weapons on their shoulder, and there was a little uh, a stream. There was a, a uh, bridge across the stream, so what the hell we're going through the stream? I went across the bridge. Jeez, I get on the other side, and there's a guy with a star, and I figured he was some GI acting up. He said, what did you come over the bridge for? I said, what the hell do you think? I says, why get what when they can come over the bridge? He says, I'm General Partridge. I said, oh, sorry, General. He started to laugh. I said, oh, that's all right. But boy, that was my first encounter with an Army General, but thank God he was very understanding. And uh, I finished my training there after uh, a year, I guess. No, after a few months. And then. 97th. We were supposed to get ready to go overseas, but they took us out to the West Coast. So we were out on the West Coast of San Luis Obispo. We were up there training, and then we went to, to, to Camp Cook. That was further up in California. And then back to San, San Luis Obispo, and then they brought us down to uh, outside of L.A. where we took amphibious training with the Pendleton, Camp Pendleton. And we took uh, amphibious training with the Marines where they taught us to get up and down the ships and all that. But well, we had a colonel with us who was hopeless. He got out of West, graduated from West Point only because his old man happened to be a, a general that they make him. So anyway, Colonel Richardson, oh, he was hopeless. In the practice, we had to come climb out, down over the side of the ship and get into these LCVIs, you know, landing craft personnel, and go around and around. And finally, we were supposed to keep uh, silence. And this Colonel Richardson was crazy. He said to the poor kid driving the, the, the boat, go to that red light. So well, the kid said, but I was supposed to go. Don't I tell you, I'm a colonel. So he goes out to the red light. And the colonel says, oh, hi there, this is Colonel John B. Richards of the United States Army. And all of a sudden, shut up, you son of a bitch, this is Admiral Turner of the Pacific Fleet. What the hell are you doing all these boys? You're ready with some Oh, for Christ's sake. So where do we go? And we go to land. All right, now, now I want to be the first off. Well, of course, on the ramp, you had metal things that grabbed your shoes, but the silly son of a gun, he went down the middle of it. And as he went down the middle of it, a wave came in, the boat went back, and he went off over Kathleen. 
Swagger stick and all. Oh, Jesus. So anyway, come, come, we'll have a meeting. How the hell are you going to have a meeting? You'll get killed. You know, sit and have a meeting. Oh, we'll have a meeting. So here's a meeting on the beach. Some brash. What the hell's going on here? Oh, I'm having a meeting. You're a GD fool. If you're in a combat, you'll all be killed. So, but that was Colonel John B. Richardson. When we got overseas, they were smart. He belonged to the WPPA, the West Point Protective Association. So they moved him to the rear. So that was the story. We had a crazy, <laughs> we had a crazy sergeant there, Joe McMinnum. And uh, Colonel Richardson didn't see too well at night, so we had to put engineer's tape from his tent to the latrine. But somebody moved the tent in the mid moved the tape in the middle of the night. Jeez, and he got all covered with you know what. Oh, he got close out of drill. He had us up there at 5 o'clock in the morning doing close out of drill to punish it. And they were all saying, me, the usual. I had nothing to do with it. I knew who did it, but I wasn't going to say who did it. So we had uh, quite a time there. And then, of course, we finally, they decided that uh, did, uh, we would go to Europe. We were supposed to go to the Pacific. So we came cross country and we were in Port of New York. And oh God, I hope if I never see the Statue of Liberty again, it'll be too soon. We were on that damn um, ferry from the station. We were going round and round and round the Statue of Liberty. We had full field packs on. I thought to go, we'd never get on the boat. What are they were doing a psychological, you know, I don't know, but we were so damn glad to get on the boat. So we got on the boat and left to go overseas and everything went fine. We had a submarine escort. No, we didn't. We we destroy our escorts, rather. But something happened with the ship the day out before we got to, out, out to La Havre. So, God, they said, Kept the destroyer with us, and the destroyer kept going around and around and around. We were scared, but finally we made it. And we landed uh, in La Havre. And just as we pulled it in La Havre, the message, Lieutenant Meade, report on the deck. Oh. Excuse I'm in trouble before I even get here. So I reported the deck, and they said, you, you're, you're to report to the chaplain in charge. Where? At La Havre. So when I got off the boat, I said, I'm supposed to see the chaplain. Well, the chaplain happened to be Leo Macaulay, who lived down the street from me in Brighton. He was a Jesuit. So I, that, that was my introduction to Europe. So I went in Leo and had lunch with him. And then we took off. We had to go to a Camp Lucky Strike, a Clamp Old Gold. See, they named the training camps over there for cigarettes, Lucky Strike Old Gold. So I think we were in Lucky Strike where we had we had maneuvers waiting, waiting for our guns to come. See, we had to wait till all the stuff arrived. So it arrived pretty well. And finally we went into combat at Arkham. And before we went in combat, uh, Father Phillips, whom I still see, gave us all general confession. And we got ready to go in. And that was the story. And <laughs> on Easter Sunday, as we were going, it was Easter Sunday. And we went up in troop train, and believe me, when they said there were 40 and 8, there was 40 and 8, all right, there were about 40 GIs in there. The train stopped. No chapel. So we got off the train, so I'm reading the prayers for Easter Sunday with all the guys around me. And all of a sudden, the damn train started to go up. Well, you never saw GIs run like hell. We had to, you know, get, catch up with the train and climb on. But it worked out well. First, we're in a, the first time we were in a convent, we were up in the Roar Pocket, the Roar Valley. That's where all the machinery and everything was made. So we had to cross the Sieg River. So we're crossing the Sieg River. I was the S2, and the S, no, I was the S2 at that time. I wasn't the S3. And I thought I saw a German helmet. So I said, she's the old man. I said, I think those are Germans down there. He said, where, behind that wall? I said, you watch, you see a helmet pop up. Sure enough, they did. So we called in artillery fire. And uh, 
the fire was long, so we told them to shut them. They shot on the fire and we got rid of all those krauts out of the way. So we kept going up through Solingen. Now Solingen is the factory, I think I'm, I'm being repetition, where they made all the arms and heavy weapons and all that stuff. The raw pocket. So we took Solingen up through there and uh, Wuppertal, that was the other big town. Finally, that was the, the closing of the raw pocket. And you know, over there, we put the people out of their houses, not that we want to be mean, but we put them out of the house and put them in, a, in what they call a gymnasium, like a high school gym here. Because if, if we went there, they'd blow it up. But when we were in the houses, they didn't blow up their own houses. That, that was what we used. And that's what we did all up through the Ruhr Valley, the Ruhr Park at Wuppertal, Solingen. We had combat up through there. And then they moved us back and we went down to a city called Remscheid. Oh, before we went, first time we went in combat, the first thing we were supposed to do in combat, they sent us out to the Rhine. We were going to the Rhine, we were going boats and cross the Rhine. It was right in the, I was going to say Copenhagen. Anyway, a big city on the, on the Rhine. We were supposed to cross that and attack the Germans. Well, thanks be to God, the boats didn't show up because the Krauts were all lined up on the other side. We'd have been killed, all of us. So it was a blessing the damn boats didn't show up. I was scared stiff, really scared stiff. I didn't know what the hell got, you know, I was getting into. And that's why when we were up in the rural pocket, every time we moved, we didn't know whether they were gonna get shot or not because when we moved in, the 8th Division was coming out. We were relieving them and they had raised a lot, lot of casualties. But fortunately, by the time we got there, most of the fighting was over. So we didn't have that hard of time. The only scouting I did, I didn't do it on, on, on foot. In other words, we went out with the Jeep. And then we'd stop. And then with my field glasses, you could see about what was coming, what was it, and I'd call back. And then they'd, lay, they'd, lay, they'd call artillery, and artillery would let put the fire on. The, the S-2 was intelligence, and the S-3 is operations. In other words, I was doing both jobs. Usually you'll go, you go out in S-2 and t have a couple of scouts with you to see what's going on out there. But by the time we got there, that was an, the Germans were all quitting. So that really, I didn't do a heck of a lot of that. I did a couple of things and called back and told them what to fire and how to fire and adjust artillery fire, but outside of that, I didn't do much. We moved and went into, uh, down to Remagen. <laughs> and at Remagen, we were sort of kind of a, a division that protected all the brass for Germany. So we're down there in Remagen, and all of a sudden, the old man, middle of the morning, three o'clock, I'm like, Mead! What? You're the only Catholic I have in the shop. Get your ass out of bed. For what? Some of the GIs put two or three nuns out of their convent. So he said, go find them. How the hell am I going to find them at pitch dark? That's your problem, not mine. So all I went, I got my driver. Not with me. We are going, didn't know where the hell we were. Dark out. Finally, this old guy was in the corner of the street, and I said, come and see here. So he came over, he thought I was going to shoot him. I know. I had a picture of my sister-in-law, a nun, holding my little, my daughter. And, her, and I said, come and see. You know, I could speak French then. Do you understand this? Yeah, 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 yeah. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Over there, over there, he was pointing to a, a bombed out building. That the nuns were there and the cellar. So, so over I go, go with Johnny, down the cellar we go, and there's three nuns, glory be to God, they're Germans that told them that we would rape them. Well, I finally pulled out the picture and I showed it to the nun, I made the sign of the cross. <gasps> so they smiled, come see here. So they came with me. We not got in the jeep, and the three nuns got in the back of the jeep. Where we go? Where, where are we gonna go? I said, going back to the convent. So the, then, then later on, the, the old man, Mead, get a group, clean that convent out. So the GIs went over, scrubbed the convent, cleaned it all up. And get them some food. So I went to pee, uh, not the pee, but the kitchen kelp. I said, hey, take care of the nuns. So they gave them better and everything. All the nuns were so happy. But the point of the story, my sister-in-law was a nun. And when I showed her to the nun, 
So when I wrote a letter to my, to my wife, I told her about the occasion we'd had these three nuns and where we were at the time. Come to find out, the nuns in this country thought those nuns were dead. And because of my letter, it was then that they found that the nuns were still alive. It was our job to go out ahead of time with scouts to find out what was going on, interrogate prisoners. We got a whole lot of German PO doubles. They were all surrendering. So we put them all in this big cathedral at night. And I had a kid from Harvard. He, he was up in the pulpit with a machine gun. And we got them, and the, the crowds were all sitting there like this all night long. We had the shades down so you couldn't see any fire. So I went to go lie down. All of a sudden, about three o'clock in the morning, I got a call. Me, go up to the church. They're having trouble with the prisoners. Oh, so up they go. I got there and there's a German field marshal there raising hell because he didn't want to have anything to do, nothing whatsoever to do with enlisted men, you know, crowds. So I said, oh, you don't want no, I, I sleep on the altar floor. Nine, nine, nine. I'm a, this, I, okay, take him out bad. I, I winked him, but, uh, take him out bad and shoot the bastards. So, so, oh, so then he decided he'd sleep on the floor. So he slept on the floor, but I often think of that picture when I went up there to see the kid from Harvard up in the pulpit with the machine gun in the church full, entirely full. And of course, the big candles like you'd use in a uh, funeral in all the windows, the candles lit because there was no light. What a sight that was. Was I glad when morning came? But the bum, he wouldn't sleep there because there enlisted men on the altar. But he went to sleep. Right after we were going toward Remscheid, we came to a place called Purple Heart Corner. <laughs> Jeez, I'll never forget it. And at Purple Heart Corner, the old way, artillery shells came and it killed the kid in front of in the jeep, took his head off. And we all hit the ground, the pavement, and the old man said, Mead, go find out where the hell that fire's coming from. So I ran down the road and put into, the, into this church, I went up and the poor pastor said, oh, I said, we're not gonna, I, I gotta go up. So I go up in the belfry, which is covered with pigeon dung and everything else, Christ, and with the field glasses, and I hollered down, I, I think the OP is in that house up at the front, that big white house. Okay, me, so he called some of the tanks up. The tank shot an artillery fire. <whistles> that got rid of the house. And it also got rid of the OP, that was the OP, so that we were able to move forward. The old man said, me, he says, I put you in foot. I says, I didn't. Yes, you did. He says, you were the combination S2 and eight, S3. All during the last six weeks. Well, I didn't think much of it. I didn't do a hell of it. But anyway, I got the bronze star. But uh, not for being a hero, just because I happen to in one instance that I told you when the cross with the other side of the wall and I had them lower the fire on that. that. That was one instance. And then the other instance was when I crawled up in the church belfry and, <laughs> and uh, directed the fire up to split this house in half. That got rid of it. So those are the two things. Plus the fact I was, I suppose, being both the S2 and the S3 at the same time made a little difference. The old man says, Mead, he says, the chaplain isn't here, but go find the Catholic Church if you want to have a mass. So I go over and I knock on the door. This rectory and this priest come out and he could speak better English than I could. So I said, Father, I'd like to have, well, he says, oh, where are you from? I said, the United States, what do you think? Well, did you ever hear of Massachusetts? I heard of Massachusetts. Do you know anything about it? I said, quite a bit, I come from there. Oh, well, he says, I came from Brighton. Said, That's so. Well, I came from Brighton too. I said, where were you? Well, he says, I was St. Gabriel's, the monastery. I said, yeah, I used to go to Mass there every morning. Well, well, he says, isn't it in that? Well, he says, okay, I'll say the Mass. But he says, uh, I want to give a homily. Well, I said, I'm sorry, Father, but there'll be no homily. What you will do is hear confessions and say the Mass, but no homily, because the old man says, Bob. And fortunately, because he was pro-German. So, <laughs> So the guys got over, they were, they were disappointed about going to confession because the other times they had a card numbered one to ten and you write down the number of sins after each commandment. But of course this priest could speak perfect English, so the guys were kind of, oh! 
the people seat. themselves were fine, but those SS, they were terrible. See, they'd take off the SS uniform. You couldn't trust them at all, although they were mean sons of bitches, because uh, they, even before the war was over, they got rid of their uniforms. They were dressed as civilians, you couldn't trust them. Unlike the Japs, the Japs were most cooperative. At least that's the way I found it. And the, the poor old Jim, you know, their mark, the old men, when they put them at the end, the old guys, sure, they were old as I am now. And they'd tell you anything. Well, so, uh, the bunker, the bunker, yeah, yeah, and they'd point to where the bunker was. V.E. Day, I was on the outskirts of the city of Prague. I was in Pilsen when that happened. I was in Remscheid. And then they said, well, you're going to go, we have to go to uh, Czechoslovakia. What the hell are we going there for? So we went with Patton's third army. Patton, I saw him coming by with a pistol. And of course, we officers, we used to hide like, we ducked him because if you didn't have a necktie on, he'd find you. Who the hell wants to wear a necktie when you get in the fanny shot off? But Patton came through and uh, we stayed with him. We went as far as Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. And we had a stop there because the Russians were coming. That's the biggest mistake they made. They should have gone in and taken the capital, but they didn't. Anyway, we stopped there. And then the war ended and uh, we came back to uh, France. And we stayed in France for a while. And uh, that was about it for Europe. Well, then, of course, <laughs> We figured we're coming home. The army, the army had other plans for us. We took the, the road back from Czechoslovakia overland back to in France, and on the way back, we saw an awful lot of sights like the cathedral of Reims and all that. And then we were, we were bivouacked in a field outside of Reims, and the old says, Me, you're a Catholic, you take these guys on a field trip. Where am I going to go? That's your problem. Go up in one of the mountains. So up we go take the whole damn battalion. I led them up there and, and we went into a little chapel. That was, and of course the Germans had used these places for OPs. We went into the chapel and they sent meals up to us and we had a great day up there and we came back down. I did that a couple of times while we were waiting for the ships to come home. When the war ended, well it was great, but we still knew, we still knew in the Pacific, but we, some of us figured, oh boy, this is it, we'll go home. But it just did. We went from Pilsen and we moved back, all the way back through uh, Germany, Fra Germany, back to France, back to La Havre, where we, where we began from. We did one day in Paris. That's the only time we had one day in Paris. And then we left. And where do you think we landed? Boston. We came home, we landed in Boston. And there was a fellow with us by the name of McGeorge Bundy. Now, McGeorge Bundy was one of the personnel in John F. Kennedy's cabinet. And Mac, when Mac saw we were coming in the Boston, he said, come on, Bob. So we hid behind some big pillars there at Commonwealth Pier so nobody got our pictures. He didn't want his picture in the paper because his father was the close friend and secretary to Henry Stimson in World War II, this McGeorge Bundy. He could have been anything, but he wanted to be in the infantry, believe it or not. So we, we went to Devons. <laughs> and uh, after we got to Devons, then they said we could have, I think it had three days. They gave us three days. So I came home, my poor wife. I came into the house and she's washing the kitchen floor. She didn't know I was home. She damn near dropped dead. So to make a long story short, I said to her, couple of days at home and then I had to go back to Devon's. So the emotions was great to see my wife and she thought I was home for good but I had a chance to see my little girl who then was a year a little over a year and a half so just walking but of course my daughter didn't know she didn't know who the hell I was you know she saw the picture she see the picture every night but that meant nothing to her. It was difficult in the sense that uh, poor Mary Jo all she knew me was from a picture and then all of a sudden, having me move in, finally, she's a smart little girl. Oh, she's smart as a whip and all true. 
But uh, it was great to be with her. I said goodbye to my wife and the little girl, and I said, well, I don't know, maybe we'll get out. We went to Fort Bragg, far from getting out. <laughs> then the atomic bomb came. So we didn't, we left Bragg to go to uh, Japan as an army of occupation. So we went out of the fort, we went by train out to Fort Lewis, got on a troop ship and took us, I'm getting a little bit screwed up here, took us to the Pacific, but on the way over, oh yeah, on the way over, we were in this Navy ship and we had a called Blackout. Jeez, I'll never forget. One night, I went to get a glass of water because you were, you were supposed to come up on the deck and left you were an officer. Lolly here with a little cap on like that. And I went to get a drink at the bubbler and the, the Marine that was standing there got belted me off oh, my tooth boat. What the hell do you think you're doing? He almost fainted when he saw I was an officer. Oh! So the old man, we're going to court martial that son of a bitch. I said, son of a bitch. It was a mistake. Mistake? Forget it. So anyway, they didn't do anything. So they had a broken tooth. So they wound up getting false teeth anyway. Well, it didn't make any difference. But uh, that was when the blackout coming across the Pacific. God, that was endless. And we stopped in the Philippines. We didn't, we, no, we didn't get off. The fellas, we were in uh, Philippine Harbor for a few days, and then they just said, "Well, wh where the hell are we going now? You're going to Japan." So we wound up. We sailed up. We landed at Yokohama. When we got to uh, Tokyo, we were north, north, north of Tokyo in a place called Urawa, U R A W A, and uh, we were doing the ordinary thing taking the Japs, uh, we weapons away from the Japs and things like that. We used to, but the Japs were most cooperative. Unbelievable compared to the Germans. So I was just fooling around there, killing time, and all of a sudden the old man sent for me, Mead, yeah. you've got two degrees. Yeah. Well, we're going to have a regimental school. Yes. Where? Oh, yeah. Well, this is this a... A place down there in Urawa, yeah, it was a Japanese army barracks. You're going to take that over and make a school out of it. For what? You're going to take GIs and we'll have the GIs in there. They'll go to your school for a month, give them a certificate, and then the high schools will accept that as a high school graduation, and then they'll go under the GI Bill of Right to Go to College. So I decided to run the school, and I had three other, all second lieutenants, three second lieutenants, and then I had a whole cadre for cooks and all that. So I opened up the school. We got the school going, the students came down, and there was some nuns there. And they had a, a, little, a little school they were trying to run. And anyway, I went to visit them one day and brought some food over to them. Oh, mon capitaine. Oh, they were. So, I said, come over to the school. Well, they were in school and Christmas is coming. So they wanted to know if they could do it. Oh, sure, you can come. So, I don't know where we stole, but we got an organ. And one of the guys could play the organ. We put the organ in the mess hall. And the kids put a crib up there. I mean, the GIs put a crib up there. And these nuns trained these little Japanese girls with little white outfits and little wings. So for, oh, before that, the old man come down and he said, me, yeah. what the hell is that star doing on top of that flagpole? You know damn well not that should be above the American flag. I said, that's right, Colonel, but you forget, the Star of David was there long before we ever had America. God, damn it, he says, you Irishmen always have an answer. All right, he says, leave it up. So the Star of Bethlehem stayed there. So I said, hey, I want your permission. What the hell do you want now? Well, I said, uh, I'd like to have a midnight mass. Oh, he says, you Catholics, you're always thinking that way. It's all right, you have a, <clears throat> you have a midnight mass, he says, and I'll put the, all those, the Jewish kids can do the guard duty. You can get the Romans in there. Oh, okay. One other, now what the hell do you want? Well, I says, I'd like a connection. You know we can't have connections in the army. What the hell's the matter with you? I says, these poor nuns, I says, the, li 
the roof leaks like hell in that comet. How the hell do you know? Because I went there and checked it. Oh, I went to the comet and I said to them, I'm going, oh, no, 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 you cannot go upstairs. That's closer. I said, closer or not, I'm going up. So upstairs I went and they had all these little pails to catch the rain when I came. Said, Don't worry, we'll take care of that system. So the old man said, well, all right, have a collection. So I had the collection. I told the GEIs what I wanted. Of course, they were all selling cigarettes and everything else. So we got over $2,000 at the midnight mass. Well, and I got permission to have some of the, the Japanese women come in, and they were dressed in their typical, you know, the yobos and all that stuff. It was quite a sight. They were on one side, and the GIs in the middle, and of course, as I said, um, the kids that I had in the school made a scene for Christmas. And that, uh, that midnight mass was really something. The GIs came in, and the, as I said, the women were there all dressed up in the, the Japanese lady. And the little kids came down from the mess hall, from the kitchen, holding a, a little infant in their hands. And, they, and of course, we were singing the Christmas hymns, and they put the infant in the, in the crib. Well, there wasn't one guy there. You know, didn't have tears. But geez, what a, I'll, as long as I live, I'll always think of that Christmas Eve over there. So I told him we're going to have a collection. I said, "This one for me is for the nuns. The roof's leaking." So we got over two thousand bucks, fixed the roof. Of course, I could do no. And then, for the rest of the time I was there running the school, I kept sending food over to the nuns. All oh, they never. At one time, I shouldn't tell you this, because MacArthur be asking me, but. Father uh, Colonel McCarty, he was a hot ticket in the second battalion. I said, Colonel, I said, the nuns, they, they got out no offices. They don't have any blankets. We'll take care of that. So we got a hold of a two and a half ton truck. We sent to some place in northern Japan, and they got about 500 black blankets and brought them back and gave them to the common. And word came out, if we find out who did that, they'll be court martialed. Well, thank God they never found out. I was all set to come home, and Frankie Lindemann, the, the major, the, the medic, <coughs> came in one day. And, How are you, Bob? I said, ah, pretty good. He said, hey, take off your undershirt. I said, what the hell? So I took off the undershirt. Your skin there. I said, oh, I said, that's the GI underwear running. He says, it is like hell. He says, you've got infectious hepatitis. Oh, I'm not supposed to go home. Well, he said, you're not going home. So they sent me down to the 42nd General Hospital in Tokyo, and I did have. I had a bad case of infectious hepatitis. And <clears throat> you know how I caught it? The nuns had a little party uh, for me at the convent. And I went there and they had chicken or something to eat. And I took a, I drank a glass of the water. And that's how I got the infectious hepatitis as I look back on it. When I went to the 42nd General, they said, oh, this is a bad case. We're going to notify you. The next kin, why? Well, you'll never survive this. I don't tell my wife, she's got enough to worry about. I'll be fine, and I was fine. About a month later, I, it was all gone. Oh, thank God, it was like being in heaven. I home again, and meeting up with some of my old friends, and, and unfortunately, finding out a lot of the kids I knew were killed in service, you know, in one branch or the other. So it was kind of heartbreaking to see all that. But by the same token, I was lucky that I went back. I had my old job back as a teacher in a junior high school. And then they, uh, the city of Boston opened what they call the veteran school. It, it took place in the old high school of commerce. And Henry McInerney, who was a Navy officer, he was the headmaster. So he got a lot of us GIs to serve. So I taught English there. I taught there for two years. And then I, I, I rated uh, at that time to be what they then called submaster. Nowadays, it's vice principal. Then I did fairly well, so I got to be. I get to be. Came a, uh, a submaster in Boston, and I went to the Dearborn School in Rochford. And thank God I retired because everybody said I was crazy to get out. 
But I got out and I had three or four, five good years until my wife came down with Alzheimer's. So thank God I retired when I did. I wouldn't have had the, the years we had. I thank, I thank God that I was able to do it. Like everybody else, I didn't want any part of it, but everybody else is gone, so I figured I'd better go through. And uh, I'm glad I did. I certainly was no hero. I was very lucky in the assignments that I had. And I was lucky that I went to Europe as, as late as I did. And that when I went to Japan, I was glad that I had the background that I had so that I could do, run the school over there. As a matter of fact, it helped me later on in life when I rated to become a principal in Boston, the fact that I had done that over there. So all in all, uh, the military was pretty good to me. I was uh, lucky that Almighty God gave me the health to survive and do what I did. I had pneumonia on three different occasions when I was in service. But I came out of it all right. I was still, my God, I weighed about 120 pounds when I came home from overseas. But I thank God that I was able to serve and that God was good enough to let me move up from being an enlisted man to an officer. I was always glad of that, that nobody handed it to me. And that uh, I saw what I did. I saw an awful lot of the world, an awful lot of the people, both in Europe and in the Pacific. Thank God that we lived in a country where we were able to serve and help out in a time of war. None of us wanted it, but since it, since it was a fact and it had happened, we all had to pitch in and do, do what we could.